Um, welcome to the tools panel. We love tools. Thank you. Thank you. So um, let's start things off with a quick round of intros. Point Hello. Okay. <laughs> let's start things off with a quick round of intros. Um, so who are you? Uh, what do you do? And also, what kinds of security tools do you either build or use on a daily basis? Hey, everyone. I'm Nat. I'm a security engineer at Trail of Bits. Um, and on a day-to-day -day basis, um, we're generally using tools like static analysis and um, fuzzing on a day-to-day. -day. Thank you. So I'm Patrick, the CEO of Fuzzing Labs, and uh, as the name suggests, we are doing a lot of fuzzing. Uh, so we are basically building security tools and dedicated fuzzer for either uh, client side or uh, smart contracts. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Gary. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Electric Capital, um, and I work on security tools that uh, kind of focus on like post deployment. So I work on like a code search tool. Um, and surfacing information that comes out after contracts are live and deployed. Hi, I am Ori. I work at Sertora as a developer and in developer relations. We're developing several security tools. One of them is uh, the Sertora Prover, which is a formal verification tool for smart contracts. And the other is Gambit, which is an open source uh, solidity mutation testing tool. Hi, I'm Bhargav. Uh, I'm part of the research and specifications team at the Web3 Foundation. I like to call myself a full stack verification engineer. So I'm interested in uh, the whole spectrum, right from like analyzing consensus protocols all the way to uh, verification at, uh, at the code level. And mostly right now I'm focusing on verification tools for the Polkadot ecosystem. Hi, I'm Yanis. I'm co-founder of DDoB. Uh, we have a public blockchain explorer that's uh, geared towards security, so we have probably the best decompiler for EVM bytecode out there. Uh, so we offer free tooling for all sorts of security investigations, but uh, our proprietary tooling has to do with uh, static analysis as well as dynamic analysis of uh, transactions. So we do both uh, bots for monitoring and we have a language for specifying those and we write a lot of static analysis for uh, code. Awesome. Um, and I'm Fraser, your moderator. Okay. So can someone or a few of you give your sort of pithy couple sentence analysis of the state of tooling in Web3 generally? It's good. <laughs> so, I mean, we, we can concentrate on the negatives, but uh, if I were to give a two sentence uh, description, uh, considering that this is a young domain, we have very, very good tooling, uh, security tooling, uh, compared to much more mature software engineering domains. Uh, we have probably the most advanced versions of tooling from uh, the formal verification side, uh, the cert or approver, et cetera. Uh, from the static analysis side, I mean, I've been in the static analysis community for over 15 years, but the best tools we have ever put out are in this domain. And it's all because there's so much money uh, at stake. So we can complain. There are definitely problems, but it's good to see where we are in the whole universe, and we have some pretty awesome tooling. That uh, actually kind of answers my second question, so I'm just going to throw that out there too, and you can answer both. Um, so how would you say the tooling landscape is different in Web3 compared with Web2? Yeah, so there is one clear difference between Web3 and Web2, right? That you can't use uh, security through obscurity in, in Web3 because like most of the code is open source. Uh, like attackers can spend months analyzing it uh, before they, uh, they launch the attack. So one of the, the key differences I would say is that since everything is open source, uh, 
the the analysis has to be much stronger and uh, obscurity c cannot be cannot be used uh, f for security i think uh, one of the main uh, differences between web 2 and web 3 tooling from the point of view of the user is that the user base of tools in web 3 is much smaller so if you need to look online for answers for your questions or look for video tutorials about how to do something with a certain tool you're probably not going to be able to find it, or at least you're not nearly um, uh, the same ease or quality. Yeah, I think to expand on uh, Bargoff's point, um, one of the main differences I see is like because it's open source, all the code is out there. You know, you can there's a millions of dollars of value behind it. You get this really quick flywheel where you know there's auditors and security researchers, and they can go audit the code, use all these tools give a bunch of feedback, and so you get this really nice virtuous cycle. And so I think it kind of leads to the tooling being really good and also evolving at a really quick rate. I would echo um, kind of the previous um, answers on the panel. The only thing I would add is that um, I think Web 2 tools in some ways are also more advanced um, than Web3 in terms of the usage in different code bases and usage across um, applications. And so I think there's also, um, in addition to that, there's also um, kind of the adoption um, and kind of more um, having developers um, actually integrate with like existing static analysis tools and fuzzing um, is definitely something that um, like should be applied to all code bases and I think is um, definitely like something that is much more apparent and needed in the blockchain space. Um, so I, I disagree a bit actually compared to what you were saying. Um, if we are speaking about Web3 in general, I think there is a huge gap between the different blockchain. Uh, I think if we are speaking about Ethereum, the maturity of the toolings are really good and we have a bit of everything and so on. But if you compare to other chain in general, um, there is definitely a lack of static analyzer, further no formal verification on some chain, especially if you also take a look at all the new uh, L2, ZK uh, stuff, there is a lot of new um, either smart contract language, um, circuit, ZK circuit and so on. And in this area, basically everything needs to be built. So if we are only taking a look at Ethereum and EVM, yeah, we are pretty mature. Uh, if we take a look at the rest, it's nothing compared to, to what we have. Yeah, I mean, definitely would agree with that. Uh, one big difference that I'd like to point out is that this is a perfect playground for security tooling. Uh, it's, it's the only opportunity one ever gets to have all the code open, all the test cases, pretty much, all the past executions permanently recorded. You can do pretty amazing security tooling in this space, in the Web3 space. And the other thing that helps tremendously is that it's small size of code bases. Like a little over five years ago, I was doing similar things. I was doing static analysis at Facebook. Uh, the Facebook Android app, which is like the little app that you install on your phone. That's 100,000 Java classes. That's the deployed bytecode, Java bytecode that goes in your phone. Like 100,000 Java classes. Imagine what tooling can analyze that versus the tooling that can analyze, you know, uh, 50 smart contracts that are typically what constitutes the, the average uh, DeFi protocol that manages so much money. So. We have a perfect playground, and we have gotten a lot, uh, a lot of advanced tooling, which is great, but certainly it's true. It's only limited to EVM, and, and especially even in EVM, mostly Ethereum. Great. Um, so that's somewhat related to this next question, which is about how you hope to see the state of tooling change moving forward. I guess we got some of that at the end. Um, yeah. We would like to see some more one-stop shops. Currently, you get uh, different tools to do different functions. So you get um, 
deployment or you get compiling or you get uh, analysis and fuzzing. So some tools have already started to move in this direction um, to great success. I think we're going to see more of that. And obviously that relates also to uh, the issue of multi-chain, which is uh, in general um, a bit of a lacking uh, area of vulnerabilities for many of the tools. Yeah. Um, to give you an example, in, in our cases, we are building security tool open source financed by grants from foundation. And um, typically, in my opinion, that's the way it should be. Uh, I definitely enjoy the different tools that most of the, the guys are building, and I'm playing with, with them at, at all, uh, with all of them. But the fact is, for me, when you have a blockchain and it's creating his own smart contract language, his own consensus, and so on, that should be the one that is financing and developing security tool to basically give that to the, to the developer. It should be at least them that is doing the first step, and then different security uh, companies and teams that basically build on top of that and provide audits and, and everything. Uh, but it, for me, it shouldn't be the, the, the other ways. Uh. I think there um, are a lot of existing tools, like, um, like for example, for static analysis with Slither, for example, um, that do provide like a lot of results that developers and like security researchers have the, op uh, the opportunity to triage. Um, I do think there's probably room for improvement in terms of reducing false positives, um, just to make sure that um, it it gives you like developers and users just a better idea of what is more likely to be wrong, um, and kind of an ease of an ex uh, ease of experience um, in terms of um, understanding like what uh, code might be affected. Um, and on the flip side, I think re um, reduce. Uh, false negatives from the fuzzing side as well to make sure that um, fuzzing tools can be extended um, easily and nicely just to make sure that bugs that should have been caught through fuzzing are actually caught. Um, and so I think there's a lot of room for improvement in kind of the existing tool space um, currently. Yeah, maybe I can give some insights uh, from uh, like the Polkadot ecosystem. So the whole ecosystem stack, uh, tech stack is uh, based in Rust. And it would be great to see s some tooling for Rust, which even before like security or a verification, the first thing is like program comprehension. So it would be great to see tooling which uh, improves like program comprehension because it's only when the developer really understands what he's doing that he can come up with invariants and so on. So that's like the, the first layer uh, that I would love to uh, see being, being developed. And of course, like uh, after that comes uh, static analyzers. And surprisingly, there isn't that much options uh, which are robust enough to be used on like production grade code. I think my uh, feeling has been that, at least for like Rush tools, uh, most of these tools are like academic in nature, and in academia you uh, tend to prioritize novelty over robustness. And so that I feel there's a huge potential here where there are great ideas, but these ideas have to translate to like robust tools that can be uh, applied on uh, production code. Yeah, so I, I would definitely agree, but there's, uh, there's a standard added here, which is there's no money in tooling. So, and especially in comprehension tooling, like there, there are well-known studies, like even Google has put something out that says uh, nobody cares about offering tools uh, to help the programmer understand. That's, that's considered low value. So you need to go directly to something that has value, which is like security analysis. So I agree that there's a lot of need there, but it's not going to be filled by the market so well foundations may need to step in to give better tools uh, at that uh, level because the market will not step in there and imagine this market with at best a few tens of thousands of developers at best uh, 
compared to the overall, the Web2 market with millions and millions of developers. I mean, there we start now to see some security tooling that's, uh, and comprehension tooling that, that has general applicability, but it's an order of magnitude uh, larger market. Uh, but certainly I will agree with everyone that there is, an, there is a lot of room for improvement. There are things we can focus on both on fall, the false positive, false negative side, but there's also a big potential for disruptive innovation here. Uh, and where do I want to see disruptive innovation? Well, first of all, we just saw LLMs, we saw AI come in, and we've seen completely trivial uses. Like you just, you find like uh, a text generator that hallucinates and you, you feed it your program and see what we'll say about it. That's not very interesting. What I'd like to do is move the frontier of what is considered automation. Uh, have a neural net come up with specifications for the Sertor approver, for instance. Have something like that, have deep automation, something that will really push what can be automated versus what's now delegated to humans and that can get us to the next level with much, much greater automation, some good security insights encoded in our tools, but at the same time, the automation will come from uh, LLMs or something similar. So there is, there's definitely a very a, a wide open horizon for things that are going to happen in the next two, three, five years. Uh, lots of potential for innovation. Thank you. Um, taking this from a little more of a visionary perspective back down to really, really minute. Uh, we touched a lot on false positives just now. I'm curious if anyone else has any opinions, feelings, thoughts about false positives. They don't matter. Ooh, interesting. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm being a little provocative. <laughs> but um, they obviously matter, but they, they start to matter a lot at above the 90% rate. That's the surprising thing, you know? Give me a true vulnerability uh, one out of 10 times, I'm still happy. If it's a true vulnerability, that's, a, that's tremendously high value in this domain. So I don't care if you give me a few false positives. It's not like uh, I'm trying to get the attention of a board programmer, uh, programming iOS applications, and now I need to give them like extremely low false positive rates. I mean, that's not the, the game here. The game here is give me high value vulnerabilities, even if nine out of 10 times they turn out to be false. Now, if it's 99 over 100, yeah, that's way too much. But you, we can suffer a lot higher in terms of the false positive rate. So that's why I don't consider this to be a huge problem. That's my controversial opinion I, I had warned beforehand. And do you think that tools in this space all seem to share that opinion or do you think different tools in different segments of the space have different reactions to false positives and this is kind of for everyone including you i have to qualify first of all sorry and that's the last thing i'll say it depends on the severity of the vulnerability if the tool is ambitious enough to go for severe vulnerabilities uh, and end to end that's when the false positive rate does not matter so i think most people will agree to that but So false positives can actually help in program comprehension. Um, our tool, for example, is iterative in nature. So you will eventually be able to eliminate most of the false positives. But uh, in that process, you are focusing on the parts of your program that uh, are the riskiest, at least in the eyes of the tool. And that in itself can help make your audits more focused, your testing more focused. Um, and uh, reduce errors in an indirect way. I do think um, in terms of something like results from like a static analysis tool going into like if you're just kind of running it on code and, and seeing results, um, it's possible that like a lot of those are false positives and maybe one of them is a true positive. But still even then, triaging those results and going through them and actually really understanding in depth what the system is supposed to do and how is it supposed to work um, is a practice that kind of needs to be done because um, that tool can essentially help you f determine those vulnerabilities and those risks beforehand. Um, I think there was a recent 
um, study that was uh, just uh, released that was, um, if you run, uh, based on previous um, code bases where Slither was run, um, it could have saved like 150 million in funds. I think that goes to show that um, developers really need to take results from static anal analysis tools um, carefully and really understand what are the true impacts of, um, even if it doesn't affect your code base right now, how will it affect your code base in the future once you do a code upgrade, once you do a migration? Um, and actually understanding like end-to-end -end what that impact has on your system um, because there's a lot of things that can fall through the gaps um, and so it takes um, a lot of time and effort to really go through those um, and triage them. Uh, I think on like the ergonomics and DevX side of things, false positives can be bad. Um, just because you know, if you keep running tools and they give you these false positives that are low severity, I, you kind of get desensitized to it and almost like annoyed sometimes. You know, like if you ever run npm install, you'll see it tells you there's like five warnings and things you should fix, but like how many of you guys have actually looked into that? And so, you know, that's possible that for some of these tools that can also happen where you might just be like, I don't want to run this anymore. It's like too much noise. Um, so I think that's definitely one concern that we should have when it comes to false positives. So one of the other uh, ways of like getting rid of false positives is to use maybe some kind of symbolic execution so that after the tool gives you this uh, possible uh, issue here, you would want to have a concrete input or like a concrete test, you know, which exposes that vulnerability. So uh, maybe there are ways where you can combine Static analysis with some symbolic execution to improve the the false positive rate. Um, so, so I totally uh, uh, agree on, on that. Um, the fact is, most or at a certain point, most advanced security analysis tool will actually directly include symbolic execution engine inside because uh, if you want to be able to find some complex vulnerability, you will be able to maybe um, suppose or at least get a range of a possible value at a certain point in time. So what I think is definitely valuable is symbolic execution to actually get a closer look of what is really happening. And I think something really important to have, and it's typically the, the first time I saw that was in Slitter, is the confidence of the vulnerability. And I think it's basically what potentially matter the most. If, uh, if you have a critical and the confidence on that is really high, uh, it's not the same than a critical with a low confidence. Um, so maybe a first step for the developer to do is actually to take a look at all the vulnerability with a high confidence score and then go to the, to the rest. Yeah, I definitely agree that static analysis should be used in combination with other tools. Um, I would also say, like, if you do actually find a true positive with Slither or any other tooling, that should be a sign that you should be fixing that vulnerability, that you should be fixing that patch and probably writing, like, a unit test or some kind of fuzzing test even, um, just to make sure that that's no longer exploitable so that in the future when you're updating your code, um, you, you've checked to make sure that that, like, it doesn't repeat itself. Um, and just making sure that you're like you're always running those tools like as you change your code and not necessarily just like write all your code first and then do the slither and like run static analysis or formal verification or fuzzing um, just because once you get to that very end um, most likely those static analysis results are going to be never ending um, fuzzing is going to be very difficult to get up because it's such a large code base that you may not have considered like what are your invariants beforehand um, and so ideally if you are running these tools like as you're creating your code um, by the end you shouldn't really have like a, a long list per se of like findings that you should be like keeping in mind within your code base it should be relatively um, succinct because it's something that you've thought about as you're building your code 
And do you find that's how developers tend to use these tools or what workflows are you actually seeing in real life? We definitely like them to make sure that they're doing this throughout this security work process. Um, I think it's, it very much depends on the project and especially if a project is set up with thinking about their inva invariants beforehand, thinking about like what their code is supposed to do, it's noticeably much easier to get um, fuzzing set up and it's much easier to triage results because there are not that many results. Um, so it's, you can very, you can, there's a very noticeable difference um, between those projects and um, from that it becomes, um, from the project's perspective, much easier for them to analyze potential vulnerabilities or like risk with like external protocols. Um, and so from their side, they have kind of a more, um, they have a safer posture, um, which can help them um, essentially future-proof their code, but also just make sure that their current versions are safe. Yeah, a lot of developers have that misconception that you should use tools as the last thing in the development lifecycle, right before, even right after audits. And um, actually, the biggest value you can get from tools is uh, from using them from very early in the process. Uh, it just gives you more economic value because the mistakes that you have, especially in your design, are going to be a lot more expensive if you find them late in the process rather than early. If you're going to do it anyway, uh, please do it earlier. I would also add that, um, especially for um, going, like after you've written your code, going into like audits or bug bounties or um, any kind of um, other eyes of, on your code, uh, at any um, third party opinions, having run Slither and having the fuzzing set up means that um, other people looking at your code can then focus on very complex bugs that integrate with protocols or different contracts. And so the quality of those bugs are likely much higher um, than those of like results from static analysis because um, these, tool these tools will help you find kind of the low hanging fruit and maybe um, complex interactions, but um, it means if you've already run those tools, when you get to um, kind of having um, that third party look at your code, um, that it's much easier to actually understand what's going on, but also identify um, potential bugs. Okay, I'll go back and push back a little on the idea that a static analysis tool especially can give you good uh, estimates of its own confidence. I mean, confidence is a great thing, but we need to be really careful when inspecting results at a certain level of confidence, and I'll explain what we are noticing and kind of why this is happening. There's this old anecdote in business settings. Uh, you have a professor, and uh, the professor is teaching uh, her students everything about stock picking, and here are all the criteria for seeing whether a company is doing well, and you have your PE ratio, and you have what uh, the executive team has uh, sold recently, and you, you have whatever criteria you want. So the entire class is learning about all of those. And the professor is like, okay, so give me an algorithm for finding the best stocks. And the students come up with something, and they state their criteria, and they run the algorithm, and it's like, there are no stocks like that. And of course there are gonna be no stocks like that. In everything that has money behind it, if you only focus at what you can be certain about, if you only focus at the highest confidence, you're not gonna find anything. And it's the same with, with analysis warnings. If you only look at high confidence, basically that's clueless code most of the time. So it's not gonna hold any money. If you do high confidence and holds a lot of money, that's an extremely rare occurrence to find anything. So oftentimes, one needs to inspect a lot more than the high confidence warnings. Why? Because the analysis itself, the automated analysis, it knows of one threat, and it knows of a guarding pattern against that threat, and it thinks it sees that guarding pattern, but it's not really there. And you have a real vulnerability, and a human needs to come in and find that even though I see a low confidence warning, this is really something that looks a little suspicious. So, yes, 
Definitely we want analysis to tell us how confident they are. Yes, we want to focus on the high confidence, but only if we have limited time for inspection. If, if it is, this is really a project that we care about, you need to inspect nearly everything that the analysis tells you about, because this is a lot of money, and the analysis is just doing its best, and it's just a machine. Yeah, I want to refer to a few things that uh, Yanis has said before um, about confidence um, in terms of uh, formal verification. Uh, so you said before that um, maybe in the future AI will um, produce specifications. So um, there is a running joke that formal verification makes sure that your code in your specification have the same bugs. Um, and that's a true risk that you can have with uh, generated specs. It might not be what you mean them to be. And um, that ties into the confidence problem that we faced. Um, and we tried to solve it using a different way um, with mutation testing. The basic idea is that you take your code, Solidity code, and include a random fault in it. And we call that a mutant. And the idea is that um, it resembles a code with a bug in it. So it should fail somewhere along your testing suit. Maybe static analysis will find this mistake, or fuzzing, or your unit tests even. And that gives you some estimate of confidence, seeing how many mutants were caught, we, we say were killed, and how many were not. And it's pluggable with um, all kinds of different tools. Is there a chance that maybe generated specs at least will be more different than specs written by the people who wrote the code? Like it, it seems like it could be an interesting moment of diff, although maybe the generated specs are like so kind of average in what they generate that they also incorporate sort of the most likely kind of bug, but I don't know. Any more thoughts on like generating specs? So, um... Yeah, I guess that will depend on the exact uh, AI technology that will be used to uh, produce these specs. I think that there are two main problems. One, um, they're going to see only specs that humans wrote, and, uh, well, most of the specs are, are, are not catching bugs, right? Um, and uh, the other is that um, we see that the more uh, tailored uh, the spec is to your program logic, um, the more kind of uh, unique bugs you can find. If it's a generic bug, um, there are other technologies that are very good at catching bugs, like static analysis, um, and you're going to, to miss out of some of the edge of that technology if you cannot really um, find something that's very different from the other programs that have been uh, used to train the AI. Okay, great. Um, thanks for coming with me on the small AI tangent. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm curious if there have been any developer responses to results from either your tools or tools you've seen that have been really surprising to you or taught you something about your tool or the state of tooling more generally. Yeah, um, there is always some funny responses from developers, to be honest. Um, like, you find a bug, they fix it and they say it's not the bug, but why did you fix it if it's not a bug? But whatever. So this kind of stuff happened all the time. Um, what, what happened as well is that the tool is too specific or not specific enough. Um, and again, that's the main issue with, um, again, if you want to have a high confidence on, I don't know, round run C, we're going to really be specific on which type of reentrancy, have a high confidence because based on the CFG, the EVM bytecode and so on, we can affirm that there is a reentrancy bug. But if it's like another variant of reentrancy, if you, if you have been there for like five or six years, uh, there was only one kind of reentrancy back then um, and, and not multiple of them. So definitely the tool at the time was only able to find the let's say the DAO rentrancy, but was not able to find the, the new read-only rentrancy or whatever that we have right now. So there is definitely um, updates to do on the tools and, um, and the fact are the developer, some of them think the tool is magic 
and that you, you will do the, all the job for you. And that's my conversion, my uh, controversial opinion about formal verification, uh, because uh, everyone wants to have formal verification, but for sure, if I'm formally verified that one equal one, it doesn't mean I'm formally verified. So um, for me, it has, there is also a, a notion of, let's say, a timeline applied to tools. Static analysis tool should be kind of one of the beginner, finding all the long inputs. Then you are doing fuzzing, uh, and then you are maybe doing symbolic execution, and then you are doing uh, formal verification. But it shouldn't be the other way around. It shouldn't be like a mixed up uh, in different order. It's really a process, and basically that's what is, uh, I think, missing in most uh, developer mind. I think one um, common question that we get around um, when we do like fuzzing workshops and sharing um, essentially how to fuzz is that if the fuzzer passes, um, then it means there are no bugs, um, which it's, it only means that there are no bugs within that iteration and that those attempts that it, in those tries that it attempted. Um, I think the other thing is that um, the, f the invariance in general, um, any tooling that you use to test your invariance, they're only as good as your invariance are. Um, and if your invariance are wrong, then um, your tooling isn't necessarily actually going to tell you much about your code, um, which is why it's so important to actually start with like what your code is supposed to do and figure out what those invariants are. Um, I mean, ideally before you even start building it, but um, that gives you a better idea of wh what you're aiming for and what you're what your code is supposed to do. Um, and only then can tools actually be useful and helpful in determining whether those actually hold. Um, sometimes users uh, on CodeSaw will use it to search for dependencies, um, which wasn't really something we like anticipated, but uh, it lets people dig into like the supply chain of the dependencies, which you know we don't, at least in Ethereum, there's no like widely adopted package manager. And so it kind of highlights like the need for some of this basic infrastructure um, for developers that, you know, it's very common in web two um, uh, programming languages. Um, so we're, we're kind of missing a lot of that key infrastructure because um, I think a lot of the focus is on, you know, the logic and the contracts themselves uh, when it comes to tooling at least, which is, you know, of course, very important as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it shows us there's still some more work to be done um, on the infrastructure side. So one of the reactions usually when uh, yeah, I try to show like a formal verification tool is uh, that, okay, this is great, so I need to write a lot fewer tests. Uh, but that's kind of not the, the best way to go forward because in, in some sense, tests are specifications, right? Because if you have a code with a lot of corner cases, well-crafted tests really tell you what, what the spec is. So uh, yeah, so even with all these uh, verification tools and static analyzers, tests are still like the, the first thing that you would need to, to write. Uh, so it's uh, like these tools are not like panacea, so they don't get rid of the need for writing good tests. I don't have exactly good stories of user feedback, but uh, mostly comments on things that were said earlier and, uh, and also controversial statements. Uh, so first of all, I, I'd like to point out that the tools are a continuum, right? Uh, I mean, there is uh, perhaps formal verification against specs on one end, but everything else is, is very much a continuum. It's not just uh, static analysis. Static analysis and symbolic execution and fuzzing could all be part of the same tool. Like in our case, they typically are. Uh, deep symbolic understanding of the program could very much go inside the static analysis tool. It could be trying to derive specifications. We're trying to do that. Uh, one thing that I think might be a controversial opinion is that the uh, the protocols that I want to use formal verification on are some of the worst written because 
I cannot understand the code fully in full confidence as a human, and there I definitely want some formal verification tool where I can just write in terms that I understand the specification and have the tool tell me, yeah, it's true. After a deposit of zero, the shares remain the same. Oh, great, because I couldn't tell that myself as a human. That indicates really badly written code. So that's kind of a controversial or negative opinion. But we have to see that what we're doing in this space is we're pushing the limits of tooling and their contribution to programming. We are having very, very advanced tools, and this is very good to see. We are seeing formal verification fully used in practice for protocols that manage lots of funds. Now, where, what are the limits there? We're discovering them in this community. We don't exactly know. It's not like other communities have done this, other software development domains have done this. We are at the forefront there. We will see what can be the impact of all sorts of tooling on automating security of software. Since we've had a few controversial opinions already, I'm just gonna open the floor for more of them. So bring your, bring your best and most controversial opinions now. I have a controversial opinion for developers, probably not to my peers. Um, but if you've tried a tool and didn't like it or uh, couldn't manage to use it well, and it was actively developed for over a year, you should give her another chance. Most tools have had some amazing development in the last year or so, and they could bear very little resemblance to the experience you've had before. It's uh, very easy to write things off. Oh, I've tried it like a year and a half ago. It was too complex, couldn't run on my code. Uh, you should try to do that again. You're missing out. Um, yeah, completely, and they actually should put that in the CI CD because the fact that the tool will evolve a lot will also um, potentially find bugs in the future. I'm thinking typically of your, the study you mentioned, Nat, um, about the fact that Slitter actually find bugs um, like on, on some contract, and if developer was using Slitter, they will, they will have find the, bug, the bugs, sorry. The question I will ask is, do the bugs that was detected in this study was actually bugs that was already on the tool at the time uh, the contract was available? Or is it like new detectors on Slitter that actually find the bugs? I'm not sure they did um, close analysis of diff the diffs between those contracts. Um, so it's uh, against the, if I'm not mistaken, the current version of Slither. Any more controversy? We should have competitive teams. Uh, I, I can, yeah, I mean, we are all against uh, formal verification, so that's, uh, that's uh, no, I, too I'm bad. Not, I'm not, <laughs> what? No, I, no I, I'm, so my controversial opinion is, yeah, formal verification is, there is way too much noise about that for not that much uh, plus-value, in my opinion. So it's a really, really controversial opinion, but, um, for me, yeah, I mean, it's something that is proven to be efficient and so on. I also disagree of what uh, um, you were saying previously regarding like, we are completely new in this area, like uh, we are like on top of the game and so on. I mean, I think most of you in the room have taken a plane to come here. And I think typically the aerospace plane security is kind of a top of what exists in terms of assurance, make sure that if your plane get any problem, you will get multiple backup and so on. We are not even close to that, in, in my opinion, on smart contract. Uh, so there is definitely some room to improvement, and uh, I definitely think we have still a lot of tools and stuff to, to do, uh, and yeah, we, we are not on top of the game on that, clearly not in my opinion. I do agree that there's a lot of tools that exist for developers to use to make sure that their code is safe, um, but then that puts the onus on developers to actually integrate them, use them, uh, use them properly, and use them in the way that they're intended. Um, and I think that's one area that um, it's, it's a very 
it's, it can be difficult to do because people just want to keep writing code and keep building new features or keep building new things. Um, but just taking some time aside into thinking about security and thinking about how to write safe code while you're developing code um, goes a long way. Yeah, so if, if I can defend a little the earlier statement and then we can, we can get back. Clearly there are domains that have had formal verification in the past. I mean, uh, in processors, in hardware, uh, subroutines have been verified routinely since the uh, Intel bugs, like uh, the AMD square root routine has been verified. Uh, control systems in trains, in airplanes have been verified. General purpose software development, completely open, that can do any calculations whatsoever, it's not a closed control system, has not been verified as aggressively as software in this domain. So we are, in, in, to a great extent, we are at the forefront. And I do believe in formal verification, uh, but I do think that the extent of its applicability and its overall impact in the industry is still to be determined. We don't know whether, uh, how much it will capture of the security assurance of the overall space. I mean, I, I think everyone will agree to that, but it's, uh, this, the, this uh, community is making great strides towards popularizing uh, formal verification uh, with various uh, companies uh, here, well represented. But uh, yeah, I think the, the truth is somewhere in, in the middle uh, there. Uh, but when I said before we should have competing teams, I meant perhaps the people who will be convinced of the value of the tool Will, should not be the people who are developing the code in the first place. Just like we have coders and auditors, uh, to some extent, it should be, for some kinds of tools, not for all of them, it should be coders and quality assurance engineers, something. And I know that's kind of an old idea, it's tired, we, we kind of don't like the sound of it, but you do need some sort of competitiveness there. You don't want to always be trying to convince the person who developed the code alone. You want to convince an adversary, so to speak. That's what I meant earlier. Yeah, so uh, another reaction to the formal verification hype and maybe tying into the question about uh, surprising customer reactions. Uh, we found out that for different people, it could be a lot easier or a lot harder to come up with invariants or specifications. And it seems to be somewhat of an independent skill uh, towards a good code writing. So people can be really good at writing uh, a complex or um, efficient smart contracts and struggle with um, writing specifications and vice versa. And uh, yeah, I don't know if there is a good uh, predictor for that trait. Okay, I just wanted to leave like two more seconds in case any last minute controversial thoughts um, came to the surface, but it seems like not so much. Um, okay, so we've talked a lot about smart contract security that's just been ambiently around, but there are also many other layers to like the DeFi stack, right? We have the protocols, we have maybe some bridges, we have wallets, we have all sorts of stuff. So what parts of the stack do you think could be better served by existing tools? And how would you like to see that, you know, change moving forward? I, I think this, the rest of the stack is definitely under threat, but it is very much a Web2 security issue, not so much a Web3 security or DeFi security issue. So in a sense, we all recognize that there is a need there, uh, but I don't consider myself at the forefront of how this can be addressed, what can be the next huge step in the Web2 security space. In, in anything that's outside the smart contract space, anything that's outside the core crypto space, let's say. Um, so I, I can mainly speak um, about basically fuzzing clients and auditing clients, which is what we are doing basically on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so typically there is clearly a lack of tool uh, on that, uh, both 
at the language level, like um, Rust, Go, and so on. There is some toolings, but no, nothing like no extra stuff for blockchain. Uh, there is definitely a lack of tools for blockchain framework. Uh, I'm thinking of Substrate, Cosmos, and so on. Um, so there is a lot of documentation and so on. But in my opinion, there is definitely a lack of tool of, okay, I'm building a Substrate blockchain. Can you find out if I'm not like providing any API publicly that shouldn't? Uh, can you verify a bunch of stuff and so on? So clearly something is missing in the ecosystem. Um, and even in terms of fuzzing, um, I've been doing fuzzing on layer one uh, and chain for quite some time, uh, and different shell fuzzing as well. And typically this kind of stuff uh, is something that is only financed by the foundation, and the, fi the foundation need to do the work and, um, and, and put money on the table, because of course a differential fuzzer, uh, like uh, the one I, I built with Sigma Prime, Beacon Fuzz, uh, is only applicable either if you are doing bug bounty and want to find bugs, or either if uh, you are the foundation and you want to find bugs on, on your channel. Otherwise it doesn't make sense to, to, to build the tool as a product, because it will be only usable for one specific scope. So typically in such cases, um, those tools need to be built uh, by some people, uh, financed by foundation, in, in the same way that foundation finance, uh, for example, um, multiple clients to get diversity of clients. So in the same way, they need to finance these tools, uh, but it, it could it's not possible to make it a product uh, on itself. So it's more like pure research and development and, and securing the, the chain itself. And it should be the same for all, all of them. I think there are generally um, many areas of growth that like automated tooling can extend into. Um, like for example, for bridges, um, yeah, you can definitely test like the smart contract on both sides um, using like the existing tools. Um, but I think there's also a lot more room for um, additional uh, automated tooling and like the locking of funds on one chain, the minting or minting in, on the other, um, or vice versa. Um, and so um, that kind of ties a little bit into differential fuzzing in terms of like if there's a reintegration of like different um, functions on both chains, um, but generally just more kind of end-to-end um, -end tests and, and kind of uh, being able to test more there. Um, there's a lot more potential that um, it's going to be very protocol specific and very dependent on what you're trying to build, um, what invariants you want to actually hold, and what you're trying to test. Um, is there's not necessarily a, like a one size fit all, um, just because of how unique and how different um, all of the existing um, contracts and protocols are outside of just the realm of smart contracts. Yeah, I think one area that uh, could use some more attention is it's kind of like fuzzy area of like behavioral security. So this kind of extends to like wallets, um, you know, having standardized UXs so that you're not just like signing a bunch of gibberish like zeros and ones and letters, um, even to like standardizing, you know, audits and package managers so that um, users and devs and security researchers have confidence about what they're looking at um, and they can actually point to like what what things are being imported and what versions of code are being used, um, and so all of these kind of contribute downstream um, to security. And so, you know, like Web two, they have like this like audit uh, standard called like SOC two. And so, you know, maybe at some point like DeFi or or crypto has its own version of SOC two, where it's like, oh, this thing is like had Slither run against it, or Tor, or whatever, and so on, and, and it gives a lot of users more confidence and actually helps us like push the industry to better adoption, because each user that has a very poor like experience getting rugged or you know just making some mistake, like they're probably not gonna come back. So we kind of need to like dedicate some more attention to the UX of crypto and the security implications there. I would like to ex uh, extend Gary's answer there. So I think it's very important to also look at uh, security from the user's point of view as well. So I think Web3 in general has brought in a lot more ideas and notions about like access control, 
with notions of proxy accounts, uh, account abstractions, and so on. And it would be interesting to have tools which exhaustively uh, check if there are any uh, ways of accessing your account without having the the credentials, you know. So these kind of basically tooling which helps you to uh, yeah to, to verify that the access control system works as intended. Great. So it looks like we have about five minutes left. So I'm going to ask one more question. Um, if I'm a DeFi developer. I'm starting a new project. First of all, how should I evaluate? You know, there's so many tools. How should I evaluate what to use? Um, and how can I think about setting up sort of a long-term tooling pipeline? I would say start with specifications. Start with identifying what your code is really supposed to do before you even start writing code. Um, that way you have an idea of where your target is, where you're aiming towards, and like what you're even trying to build. Um, and then really just integrate um, security tools like Slither and Echidna into your um, CI pipeline, just to make sure that every time you're updating code, you're adding, you've decided, oh, it, my code is going to support a new feature, run Slither on it, write a small fuzz test on it. Um, Making sure that you're essentially up, updating and making sure that that uh, those that the static analysis results are triaged and the fuzzing um, is up to date according to what you're trying to build and kind of keeping your specs up to date. Um, I think that's the perfect way to start because if you start with that, then you you're essentially growing a list of um, your your specs and like your unit tests and and your uh, fuzzing tests can essentially help with identifying what your invariants are, um, and it becomes much easier to actually create like a mental model um, of your code base and identify like what and where things could potentially go wrong, um, either in the future when you update and like add a new feature, um, or just like make changes to your code. Um, it gives you a much better idea of how you set up, how you have set up your code. Um, and where like potential problems are, are likely to be. I would say, first of all, there, there's lots of tools to get started uh, with a new project right now, or for developers that are just getting into the space or they're, they're launching a new project. So obviously they'll start from the free ones, they'll, they will run Slither. But first of all, you need to write lots of test cases. And then you need to write parametric unit test cases, like good things that do invariant-based invariant fuzzing. And we have Foundry has an amazing facility for that, best that you can get in almost any software development domain. So you start from those. You start by writing your invariants and having a fuzzer that knows about invariants generate tests. You go and you run a static analysis tool. And then you, you are there and you've done the basics. Uh, and you're thinking, do I need to write specifications? Do I want to write specifications? Am I skilled to do that? Uh, we are already, we've already eliminated 98% of the developers right there, because at least in most projects, uh, there's not even sufficient test coverage, let alone all the advanced things that we're talking about. But if we're going to something more sophisticated, uh, yes, you, you then think of, of all the a little more advanced, maybe proprietary tools, uh, maybe writing specifications, maybe uh, using the Sertor approver in a pay-as-you-go way or commissioning if it is going to be a project that has the budget for that. But that's kind of the gradation. But at the, at the beginning level, there's amazing tooling already. Um, I mean, I, like I was saying before, I've been uh, very pleasantly surprised, even by the, I don't remember the exact terminology in the docs, but the parametric unit testing in, in Foundry. Just write invariants and I'll generate good tests for you within those. Yeah, so uh, I would say like the first thing is to start with a clear threat model and then also clarify the basic trust assumptions that you have when you're building uh, the system or the protocol. And there's actually, a in, in the tooling landscape, there's an uh, inherent trade-off between uh, 
automation and expressivity of the kind of bugs that the tool can uh, detect. And it's, you can't have usually both of them, right? So you either uh, go f for the particular use case that you have, you either go towards like automation where you, you get uh, security guarantees, but only for a particular class of bugs, or if you want to verify like the consensus mechanism of the protocol itself, then uh, you would have to invest a lot more uh, time and effort. And it, it's always yeah worthwhile to uh, think if it justifies the, the time and effort that uh, you invest in it. Yeah, I agree with my peers. You should uh, definitely start early if possible. Um, try to use uh, yeah, the, the more generic, less specific tools um, first. And one important thing that I want to add is that you need to evaluate your testing as you go. If you find lots of bug in a specific area of your code, obviously you'll want to focus more there. And maybe controversially, if you don't find any bugs, that's even worse for you, because then you don't know, you have more, more unknowns for you. Like, I would be even more uh, paranoid if I can't find many bugs in my code. But definitely do some uh, reevaluations as your uh, code matures and uh, uh, remember to do this once in a while instead of saying, hey, I have no new bugs, that's it. I'm good to go. Uh, not at all. And uh, I think also something to, um, for, the, for the beginner developer, um, it's also reuse existing library. I mean, we don't have anyone from OpenZeppelin, but I think they are a good example of uh, basically some kind of best, best practices that you should do. There is multiple templates uh, of contract, um, so there is a huge, huge chance that you can basically start from that and using what is already provided to you uh, as a basis and then just ramp up on, on top of that. So I think it's also uh, really important to uh, actually take a look at what exists and is already secure by, by default. I would also just add, uh, not like in addition to not reinventing the wheel, just start small in terms of like what you're actually trying to build, and don't just create one piece of code base that has like 15 different features, and then um, treat that as your proof of concept. Just because it's going to be really hard to understand how how is that code supposed to work, and what are the potential impacts of a code base of that size. So if you start small instead, and start with like a minimal viable product of what your code base is intended to do in the future, and then by some version, you'll have essentially what your code is end to end, and you do that uh, piecemeal, it's much easier to actually understand um, what the impacts of adding new features and new code is. Great, okay, I think that's all we have time for. Um, so thanks to all the panelists, thank you all for coming and listening. We really appreciate it. <laughs>